All right. Hopefully during your break, you went and grabbed your benchmark reader and a highlighter or a pen or something to write with. Um, we're going to be reading a story today about Thurgood Marshall, um, who was awarded the Liberty Medal. Um, and so what we're going to be reading is his acceptance speech. So lots of speeches in this, um, this unit of benchmark. But to start with, I, am, I like to show you guys a little video so that way you can kind of get to know who Thurgood Marshall is. So we're gonna start with that. So let me go ahead and get this up and ready and let's learn about Thurgood Marshall. Growing up in my house was interesting with rules I had to follow. As a kid, I lived with my mom and my grandma. And when my mom was away, my grandma told me what to do. She told me what chores I had to do she would tell me how long I could watch TV and how much time I had to play outside. Basically, she ran the house. She was kind of like a judge. Just like she has her rules, judges have laws to listen to. They make decisions based on the laws that are in place and provide those decisions to others so that everything can work out okay. Right now, I want to talk to you about a famous person in history who was a great judge by the name of Thurgood Marshall. Have you ever heard of Thurgood Marshall? Well, if you haven't, that's okay, because he was a lawyer and a judge. Not only was he a lawyer and a judge, but he was the first African American to be named to the Supreme Court Justice in the United States of America. Thurgood Marshall was an inspiration to many minorities looking to go into the practice of law. Now, talking about his life, Thurgood Marshall was born on July 2nd, 1908 in Baltimore, Maryland. Like many African Americans during this time in history, their lives were impacted by the practice of slavery in the United States. For example, Thurgood's grandfather was a slave. Although Thurgood's grandfather was a slave, he did escape slavery, making his way to the North and gaining his freedom. As for Thurgood's parents, his mother was a teacher and his father was a steward at a country club there in Baltimore, Maryland. Although Thurgood's father worked at a country club, he loved to go downtown and listen to court cases because he loved the law. When he was not working, he'd hang out down there and take Thurgood. This is where Thurgood Marshall got interested in the law and started to go into that direction from there. During that time, schools were not like they are now. Thurgood wanted to go to the University of Maryland, but couldn't because they did not allow African Americans to attend school there. Seeing that he would be turned away, Thurgood attended Howard University to learn law, and he eventually passed the bar exam, which anyone who wanted to become a lawyer had to pass, and then Thurgood became an attorney. After becoming an attorney, Thurgood moved back to Baltimore, Maryland, and helped another student who was just like him and got turned away by the University of Maryland. He fought for that student and eventually won the case, and that stopped the University of Maryland from not allowing African Americans to attend their school. Another organization he helped was the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or you may have heard of the NAACP. Thurgood became the chief counsel for the NAACP, which meant that he was their go-to lawyer. Think of him in law like Michael Jordan or LeBron James to basketball. He was the man when it came to court cases. Thurgood would help to fight cases where African Americans were mistreated or wrongly accused and discriminated against. As a matter of fact, just like LeBron is the king and Michael Jordan is MJ, Thurgood had a nickname too. They called him Mr. Civil Rights. One of the best parts of his career was in 1954 where he worked on a case called Brown versus the Board of Education. At that time, schools were stopping kids from being together and separating them based on the color of their skin. Thurgood argued that the Constitution did not allow this and won the case, changing the school system in the United States. He was later appointed to the United States Court of Appeals by President John F. Kennedy as a judge and kept going from there doing big things in the world of law, and he was finally recognized by President Lyndon Johnson, who named him to be the first African American to be on the Supreme Court. Marshall died on January 24th in 1993, but not without leaving a legacy of fighting for the rights of equality for all men and women in the United States. It just goes to show a dad's love of the law influenced a son, which influenced change in the United States. All right. So again, just a little brief background history on Thurgood Marshall. Hopefully by now you have your benchmark readers out so we can go ahead and start reading.
Let me share that screen with you. We're on page 22. And it's I, Thurgood Marshall's Liberty, Accept, Liberty Medal Acceptance Speech. I'm going to read the first paragraph to you guys. I, um, it says, oh, is there a question? I couldn't hear you. Okay, all I've said is you should have your benchmark reader out. We're on page 22. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, Emily, I see your hand is up. I want to read. Okay, I, okay, I haven't asked for readers yet, but thank you. Uh, give me just a second here. All right, so Thurgood Marshall's Liberty Medal acceptance speech. Thurgood Marshall, 1908 to 1993, was a well-known civil rights lawyer before he became the first African-American to serve as a justice on the United States Supreme Court, 1967 to 1991. He gave the following speech at Independence Hall in Philadelphia on July 4th, 1992 the 216th anniversary of American independence. In his speech, in which he accepts the prestigious Liberty Medal, Marshall reminds people that the fight for constitutional freedoms and equality is an ongoing battle. And it is an ongoing battle, right? It's a battle that's still being fought today. So um, really that's the key part that I see in that first paragraph. The fight for constitutional freedoms and equality is an ongoing battle. I would say, make sure you highlight that. And then down below, you can see there's that picture of Thurgood Marshall. It looks like he's in a courtroom, okay? You guys remember the Supreme Court? We talked about that in our um, Dred Scott um, story that we read last week, how the Supreme Court is like the highest high court that there is. All right, Emily, you wanna read paragraph one for us? It, it, it is a pleasure to speak here on the anniversary of our nation's independence. As someone who relish, relishes, relish, relishes the ability to do and say whatever I please, independence is a con. Concept? Concept near and dear to my heart. Yep, independence, right? Something that's near and dear to his heart. It's something that is super duper important to Thurgood Marshall, as it should be to pretty much everybody. Um, somebody else can go ahead and start reading paragraph two. Go ahead, Morgan. <laughs> Because you were kind enough to invite me here, I'm not going to bore you with the speech. I'm not even going to tell you I'm not going to bore you with the speech and then proceed to talk for 30 minutes. What I'd like to do is share a few stories and a few anecdotes of people who have understood the meaning of liberty and struggled against the odds to become free. I think of these people because of the risks they have taken and the courage they have displayed of value. I value them not only because of the kind of people they were, but because of the kind of nation they insisted that we become. I respect them not because of the influence they wielded, but because of the power they seized. Awesome. Um, what does that word anecdotes mean? Somebody other than Morgan who just read. What does this word anecdotes mean? Let's look for some context clues in there. Anna, do you have an idea? No, I just wanted to read the next paragraph. Okay, I haven't gotten there yet. I have another question that I've asked. Does it like people that are related to his speech, kind of? Say it again. Is My guess is like, people who are related to a speech that he's going to use to tell people okay. why. Yeah, yeah. Look at what it says. What I'd like to do 
is share a few stories, a few anecdotes. A few stories, a few anecdotes. They're stories. He's just saying it in a different way, okay? This is called an appositive where we have a few stories and then see how there's the two parentheses? We have the two parentheses that's kind of defining that few stories. It's like if you were to say, my teacher, comma, Miss Triplett, comma, is the best teacher in the world, because that's something that you would probably say quite frequently. Um, that would be using an appositive because you're explaining who your teacher is by using her name in between those commas. Um, but really, the, the more important part of this here is I, I kind of like the beginning of a speech. You know, thank you for inviting me. I'm not going to bore you with a long speech. I'm not even going to tell you I'm not going to bore you and then continue to go on and talk for 30 minutes and bore you, right? Because a lot of times people say, oh, this won't be boring. And then it really is boring, okay? Um, what he wants to do in his speech, though, is share some stories of people who fought for their own liberty, okay? Let's have somebody else read paragraph three. It is useful, I think, to recall their stories, not to dwell on the past, but lost your sound, Carter. But to see concrete evidence, I lost you. But to see concrete evidence of what was in order to gain inspiration for what can be. So evidence. Where was it? Da, 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 da. Evidence for what was inspiration for what can be. Okay, let's go ahead and write our um, short summary for those first three paragraphs. Okay, first three paragraphs. So I'm going to start off with his full name um, and then do my little abbreviation again like we did for Dred Scott. So Thurgood Marshall. Remember, you always want to start with the full name first and then put what your abbreviation is going to be in parentheses. That way you don't come back to it later and be like, what? What was that TM? Um, Thurgood Marshall said in his speech, uh, well, hang on, not in. He said his speech would be about real people who fought for freedom a reminder of what has changed and what still needs to change. Right, his speech is gonna be stories of people and through those stories, he's gonna to talk to us about things that have changed and things that haven't changed yet, but need to change, okay? Um, Hazel, when you're finished writing, will you read for us? Are we on paragraph four? We are. Do you remember Hemen? Heeman, how do you? Heeman Sweat. He has an or he was an ordinary man who had an extraordinary dream to live in a world in which Afro Americans and whites alike were afforded equal opportunity to sharpen their minds and to hone hone their skills. Unfortunately, officials at the University of Texas Law School did not share his vision. Constrained by the shackles of prejudice pre pre and incapable of seeing people, and incapable of seeing people who, for who they were, they denied human sweat ad admission. I lost you, Hazel.
So they denied Heeman Sweat admission to law school solely because his color was not theirs. It was devastating, a devastating blow and a stinging rejection. A painful reminder that the chasm that separates of the chasm that separates white from Negro. Um, so, so here he is telling his first story, Heeman Sweat, who's an African American who wanted to go to law school, but he couldn't get into the law school. He was denied admission. He couldn't get in to law school because his color was not the same as theirs. Okay, a stinging blow, devastating rejection, and a remind, reminder of the chasm that separates white from Negro. Chasm is, a chasm is like a valley. It's like, um, a, a, it's like a deep break in the earth between two sides. I thought it was chasm. Chasm, chasm, yep. I might be saying it wrong, Spencer, thank you. All right, let's keep going with the next paragraph, paragraph five. Um, uh, Anna, can you read this one? But he meant sweet, sweet held on to what racism tried to snuff out. A sense of self and rec re and a recognition and a recognition of place. A determine a determination to attain the best and a ref refusal to settle so. settle for anything less he knew that that whites and se segregationists tried to forget that none of us none of us if we're white or blue will ever rest until we are truly free good um the the big punch line in this one he sweat knew that what white segregationists tried to forget. He knew the truth, what other people were trying to like, nah, you know, that it's not still happening. No, that's not around here. None of us, Afro, white, or blue. Are they really blue? No, he's using it to make a point. It doesn't matter what color you are, that no one's ever gonna rest until everyone is truly free, okay? We've got the picture up at the top there. Um, segregationist Jim Crow signs separated the races in the South. We cater to white trade only. You see a lot of pictures of drinking fountains and bathrooms that were segregated based on color. Um, here we have a picture of Heeman Sweat. Sweat v. Painter, that's the name of the court case. Okay, so when you see something like that, that's the name of a court case. This was in 1950. <coughs> Heeman Sweat, 1912 to 1982, filed a lawsuit to gain admission to the University of Texas Law School. At the time, the separate but equal racial segregation laws prohibited African Americans from attending white only schools. Marshall tried the case in front of the Supreme Court in 1950 and won. So at this time, Marshall was the lawyer, okay? He wasn't a judge, he's the one trying the case, he's the lawyer. Um, influencing the landmark board versus the Brown Board of Education ruling in 1954. In this photo, Sweat is waiting online to register, should be in line, waiting in line to register for um, University of Texas because um, there was no online back then. So our paragraph for this one, and I'm not going to worry about saying um, or abbreviating him and Sweat because we're only going to use his name this one time. But Heeman Sweat, let me spell it right, S-W-E-A-T-T. -T. Um, he took his personal battle to court, right? His personal battle of trying to get into law school. Took his personal battle to court to gain his constitutional rights. He had the right to go to school. Question, Morgan? Um, I didn't finish highlighting on the last page. Okay. Um, I, I can try and go back to it later, or I'm also recording this, so you'll be able to see it there. Okay. 
Um, I do, I'm gonna try and move this up a little bit. I do wanna also highlight down here, cause this is super important, that Marshall tried the case in front of the Supreme Court in 1950 and won. Okay, Miguel, did you wanna read aloud? Yes. Okay, whenever you are finished, you can go ahead and um, keep reading for us. Okay. It's a oh, long I'm gonna one. Go. I'm going to go read. Okay, paragraph six. Heeman Sweat did not pursue liberty alone. Just a few years earlier, a couple man named Shelley tried do to do what white American had done for years, live in a neighborhood of their choice. But to white homeowners in Missouri, such odd audacity, uh, audacity uh -huh. was too threatening to be tolerated in their view. Whites belonged in one world, Negroes in another. They could not see the similarities that linked them to the Shelleys. The common desire to earn a living to raise children, to own and care for a home. They saw only difference, I guess, to them. If the United States was indeed a melting pot, then Negroes either didn't get in the pot or didn't get melted down. Whatever the reason for their myopic, myopic vision, the Shelleys were forced to do what Negros have had to do for years, use the only weapon they had, their right to a day in court to gain the rights to which they were constitutionally entitled. Fortunately for our history, the Shelleys won their suit, but even if they had lost, they would have known more freedom than the whites who tried to shut them out, but ever know race, race, racism, racism separates but never liberates, hatred generates fear, and fear once given a foothold block, binds, consumes, and imprisons. Nothing is gained from prejudice. No one benefits from racism. Good. No one, yeah, nothing is gained from prejudice. Awesome. That was a great job, Miguel. That was a great big paragraph. Um, and then down below, it has the Shelley versus Kramer. And again, this was a fight over just buying a house in a community that is a white community, right? Wanting to live somewhere that they weren't supposed to because it wasn't a black neighborhood. So Shelley V. Kramer, 1948, an African-American family was barred from purchasing a home, and that's the picture of the house, in St. Louis, Missouri, in 1945. Um, Marshall argued the case in front of the Supreme Court the court ruled that restricting the sale of a home on the basis of race violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. So they won. The Supreme Court said, nope, you cannot deny them the ability to purchase this house because of their race. So they weren't allowed to do that. So um, I'm going to, we'll write this down in our planners in just a minute. But you guys are going to do your own highlighting and main idea sentence to go with paragraph six. Don't do it yet, though, because I also want to take you to, um, I think I have it open, to look at our benchmark slides for today. Just to kind of take a quick peek at these um, questions we're going to be answering. All right, so the first one on slide two, what are the key details in paragraphs one through three? And then the key details in paragraphs four or five. So you're just writing down the key details from those two paragraphs, which we've already kind of done, right? And then use the key details to write a summary. And again, it should be a five sentence summary. 
um, for that first part of the Liberty Medal acceptance speech. Those are your two um, slides that you have to do for benchmark. So let me hop back over to here and let's take out our planners. Remember, some, one of these days I'm gonna ask you guys to take a picture and send me your planner, okay? You need to be writing in your planner every day for me. So your first thing that you need to do is to um, highlight key details and write main idea for paragraph six, okay? That was this one right here, paragraph six, the one that um, we just read on human sweat, okay? Highlight the key details and write a main idea for paragraph six. That's your first thing. Your second thing are your benchmark slides. One, oh, I, it's not one and two because one is the title slide. Benchmark slides two and three, okay? And guys, you need to be completing these each day so they don't build up and give you a whole lot of work to do on Friday or over the weekend if you don't do it at all, okay? I know that there's a lot of slides in that slide deck, but if you do them on the days they're assigned, then it's really not that much. There's only two instead of six to do, okay? So those are your things. Um, we are doing lunch in 30 minutes today. Lunch is at 12 and you're back at one. So it's an, oh my goodness, not bark. What am I writing? It's not an, um, just a short lunch. It is an hour long lunch today, back at one o'clock. And tomorrow um, it was suggested that maybe we can do lunch together online. Um, so tomorrow, if you want to eat lunch as a class, um, I'm going to have it Zoom open up during lunch and we can hop on, we can eat as a group, we can break into smaller groups. So it's not as overwhelming having, you know, 20 people try and talk. If there's 20 of you that sit around, we could break into groups of four or five and then switch the groups up as we go during part of the lunchtime. We'll probably do it for the first half hour of the lunch. Okay. So tomorrow, if you want to stick around, have your lunch ready to go at 12. And then um, we can stick on Zoom and eat lunch in small groups, okay? So that is all that I have for you.